Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy. Okay, so we're just discussing uh, the properties of this dye, acridine orange, and why it's ideal for staining uh, vesicles containing neurotransmitter, or in this case, adrenaline slash epinephrine. Okay, well the reason is that uh, synaptic vesicles are, have an incredibly high proton concentration. So if this is a synaptic vesicle here, basically in the membrane of the synaptic vesicle, you have something known as the vesicular proton ATPase, okay? So this is known as the V-ATPase, V ATPase for the vesicular proton ATPase. So this is the vesicular proton ATPase. And what this protein does is that it hydrolyzes ATP to ADP in inorganic phosphate. So here comes in the ATP, and it's hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. And when it hydrolyzes the ATP to ADP and inorganic phosphate, it uses that energy to pump a proton into the synaptic vesicle. So let me draw this VATPase in a bit of color. So in blue here, this is the VATPase, the vesicular proton ATPase. And it's going to use um, the energy that it gets from hydrolyzing ATP to pump a proton into the uh, vesicle, basically. Okay, now that's going to give you a very high concentration of protons in this synaptic vesicle. Now, the reason that the synaptic vesicle needs this high concentration of protons is that it then has secondary active transport proteins, which will allow protons to leave the vesicle down their concentration gradient in exchange for um, a... Um, a, well, a neurotransmitter molecule being moved into the synaptic vesicle. In this case, what you'll have is a transporter which will move adrenaline slash epinephrine into the synaptic vesicle, which is a transporter known as the vesicular monoamine transporter. So let me write that up here. So VMAT stands for the vesicular monoamine transporter, which will... Uh, or which will exchange, basically, a proton for a monoamine, such as adrenaline or epinephrine. Vesicular monoamine, uh, that's it, transporter, VMAT. Okay, so let me colour in VMAT here. So that's why you need this high concentration of pr protons in the synaptic vesicle. It's just that they are used uh, in order to... Um, build up a concentration gradient so that you can then use that concentration gradient with a secondary active transport protein to exchange the protons for uh, the molecule that you want to sequester within the synaptic vesicle. Okay, now why is this ideal for acridine orange? Because when we put in the acridine orange, when it's initially in the normal cellular fluid, basically, uh, or the extracellular fluid, when proton levels are at normal, normal sort of neutral pHs, then this molecule doesn't get protonated. So it's initially uncharged, which means that it can diffuse through the plasma membrane, it can diffuse into the vesicle. So let me show this happening. This is acridine orange. It can diffuse into the, into the cell. It can then diffuse through the membrane of the synaptic vesicle and go into the synaptic vesicle. Now, what will happen in the synaptic vesicle? there's a very high proton concentration in the synaptic vesicle. So, the acridine orange molecule will get protonated, and when it gets protonated, it gets charged. And when it gets charged, it can't then go through membranes anymore because it's polar, it's not lipid-soluble anymore. So it gets trapped within the synaptic vesicles, so it just can't get out. So gradually what's going to happen is you're just going to build up more and more and more acridine orange within these synaptic vesicles. And that's why um, acridine orange is ideal for staining synaptic vesicles. Okay, so that's the stain that we're going to use. Now time to actually explain total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy. Okay, right. So uh, let's get our chromaffin cell here. Okay. So here's our, whoops, here's our chromaffin cell. 
Here are our synaptic vesicles, which have now been stained with this acridine orange stain. And by the way, acridine orange, it's basically a fluorophore. When you shine certain frequencies of electromagnetic radiation at it, it will be excited to a higher energy state, and then when it comes down the energy state, it will then release orange light. So, for that reason, it's called acridine orange, and for that reason, I will colour it in orange. So, we've got these vesicles, which are filled with this acridine orange here. Okay, right. Now, what we do is we put this on a glass slide here. Okay. Right, so here is our chromaffin cell, stained with acridine orange, on a glass slide. So this is a piece of glass, okay? Now, what we do is we fire electromagnetic radiation at the cell on an angle, like so. And what happens is that the light gets totally internally reflected like this. So the electromagnetic radiation gets reflected by the piece of glass, basically. Okay, so this is total internal reflection. Now, for reasons that I don't pretend to understand, so this is total internal reflection, some of the energy does not get reflected. Instead, some of the energy continues on, basically. So some energy moves into the cell somehow, and this movement of energy that you get when you... So basically... Let me go over this again. You fire electromagnetic radiation at this uh, glass plate. It reflects off, but not all of the energy reflects off. Some will go in, basically. And this movement of energy into the cell is what's known as an evanescent wave. Okay? So this is energy moving into um, this little layer of the cell, basically. So this is known as an evanescent wave. So this is an evanescent wave. Okay, right. Now this evanescent wave of energy does not propagate very far. It only gets around 300 nanometers. So the evanescent wave won't penetrate very far into the cell. It goes around 300 nanometers. And to put you in scale of how small that is, uh, 0 0.1 nanometers or one angstrom, one angstrom, is, um, it's the um, diameter of a hydrogen atom. So that's, this basically is the 3,000 times the diameter of a hydrogen atom, but that's not that much when you think about it. Okay, right, so this is diameter of a hydrogen atom, uh, equals diameter of a hydrogen atom. Diameter of a hydrogen atom. Right, okay. But the point is that you do get this energy spreading in to this first little layer of the cell, diameter of a hydrogen atom. Right, now what's going to happen is this energy is going to excite the acridine orange. So the acridine orange is going to absorb some energy it's going to absorb the energy from this evanescent wave, and then what it's going to do is it's going to re-release this energy as light, and it's going to re-release it as orange light. Okay, so we'll get orange light coming back at us. So what we do is we then take a picture of this orange light here. So we'll have a camera basically collecting all of this orange light that's coming back off it, and, uh, well, coming off it, and we then get a picture of our cell, a 2D picture, of course. So what we'll get is a picture of this very thin layer, and that's the beauty of this. You're only going to get light being emitted from a tiny, thin layer, so you're actually going to get a decent picture, whereas if you were getting light emitted from every single layer of the cell, then it would be a total mess, basically, because you'd be getting, you wouldn't know where the light had come from. You'd just know it had come from this sort of vertical line, but you wouldn't know where the, which sort of vertical height it had come from. Whereas the beauty of total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy is you're doing it for a very thin layer. So uh, practically you can say, well, it's within 300 nanometers of there. So what you're going to get, basically, is if we draw the picture of what you're going to get, let's say this is your circle of a cell, 
So I'm saying we're looking now from this perspective here. So imagine we're sitting underneath the glass plate and we're looking right up at the cell, looking at all the orange light that's coming back. So this is the bottom of the cell. This is the glass plate now. Okay. So what we're going to see is we're going to see orange light where these vesicles were. So we'll see the base of these vesicles here. Okay. Which are docked at this bottom membrane here. Okay. So here are these vesicles. Now, if we are lucky, what will be happening is that there will be some vesicles that are sort of over here, so let's say here, which will actually fuse with this bit of membrane here that's in the, in the correct plane for us to actually see it fuse with the membrane. Okay? So, if we're lucky, what we will actually see on this picture is we'll see some vesicles that are in the correct plane for us to actually see them um, actually fusing with the membrane. Because the problem is, if these vesicles here fuse with the membrane, we won't see, be able to see it. Uh, because, you know, we're looking up from there. Um, so, we'll just see them moving towards us. Whereas, if we have some that are here and fuse with the membrane here, then that we'll actually be able to see that fusion. So indeed you can actually visualize the fusion of synaptic vesicles with the plasma membrane through this, um, through this technique, this total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy. Okay, now another interesting thing is uh, that what, what you see afterwards, when you've stimulated a cell to release these synaptic vesicles, and I should have said that actually, you do actually need to stimulate your cell in order to get it to release these synaptic vesicles. You'll do that by putting it in a high concentration of potassium chloride. Okay, so to stimulate the actual exocytosis of these vesicles, what you do is you put the cell in a high concentration of potassium chloride. What this does is it means that the concentration of potassium chloride extracellularly is going to go up hugely. Okay. Now, the concentration of potassium intracellularly is usually around 155 millimolar. If you raise the concentration of potassium chloride extracellularly to above that, then what will happen is through the potassium leak channels, you will actually start getting the movement of potassium into the cell. So usually, potassium moves out of the cell. When the cell is at electrical equilibrium, potassium is moving out of the cell. The reason being that you have usually an extracellular concentration of potassium 4 millimolar. Okay, so that's the usual extracellular fluid concentration. If you raise this massively, then you're actually going to start getting potassium moving the other way. And this potassium moving into the cell will depolarize the cell membrane and cause exocytosis. So, if you do stimulate your uh, chromaffin cell to release the synaptic vesicles, you can actually see them fuse with the plasma membrane with, through this technique. And moreover, once they have fused and they've released their neurotransmitter contents, you see other synaptic vesicles starting to move in to replace them. So, you see new ones moving in to the vacated slots of the old synaptic vesicles, which have been exocytosed. And the rate at which we see the synaptic vesicles moving is at 114 nanometers per second. Now, that is far too fast for diffusion. So, what this suggests is that there is some sort of transportation mechanism by which the synaptic vesicles actually move into uh, the, well, the active zone of the cell, basically. Okay, and we think this is via microtubules, so we think they are transported along microtubules. Okay, right. So, uh, that is total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy and how we can use it to visualize exocytosis of, um, of um, well, of synaptic vesicles, but I don't know whether you'd call these synaptic vesicles in the case of chromaffin cells, so maybe just vesicles containing a molecule. <laughs>